We got some good crowd in the room, and uh, hello everyone online. Nice meeting you all online. Hi. Um, my name is Henry Yang. For those of you who does not know me yet, uh, I am serving as an assistant graduate chair at School of Architecture at Woodbury University. It is my honor to introduce both Ross and Vensi Slabov and Graham Harmon today for their debate and talk, and hopefully we can get some insightful comments and questions at the end as well as a discussion. So please stay until the end for the discussion. Um, let me introduce quickly about these two amazing people uh, on the podium. Uh, Rosson Vencislavov received his philosophy PhD in 2011 from the Graduate Center of the City University of New York from, uh, and has been teaching at Woodbury University since 2012. Originally from Bulgaria, he lived in Brooklyn, New York for 13 years. While pursuing his doctoral degree, he taught at the City College of New York and the Fashion Institute of Technology. His primary research interests are in aesthetics, art criticism, and the history of philosophy. He has published and presented work on architecture, popular music, curating, urbanism, etc. He regularly teaches the core ethical systems class along with many upper division electives, such as philosophy and architecture, celebrity, the body beautiful, philosophy of history, and etc. Graham Harmon is Distinguished Professor of Philosophy and Liberal Arts Program Coordinator at Southern California Institute of Architecture. He was born in 1968 in Mountain Venom, Iowa, and earned his BA from St. John's College, Maryland, his MA from Penn State University, and his PhD from DePaul University. He is the author of 18 books, most recently, Art and Objects, which was published in September 2019. Graham is the 2009 winner of the AUC Excellence in Research Award. In 2015, he was named by Art Review as the number 75 most powerful influence in the international art world. And in 2016, was, he was named by the best schools to their alphabetical list of the 50 most influential living philosophers. I myself was a student for Graham Harmon when I was a postgraduate program, so it's really nice to see him again here. And I am also auditing Rossin's class this semester for philosophy and architecture, so it's really interesting to see both figures <laughs> at the same table, and I'm hoping to great, um, hear great conversation. Take it away, Rossin. And also thank you to SciArc for uh, letting us um, have Graham for a second. <laughs> um, so um, Graham and I have uh, complicated legacies. Um, he has a book called Skirmishes. And I started a, series, a talk series at the ICA LA called Boxing Philosophical. So we are assholes by trade. Um, now, we've agreed that this is not going to be a skirmish or a boxing match. <laughs> um, but um, hopefully, it gets to be a freewheeling discussion of, the, of, of, of our main topic, which is what architecture and philosophy can learn from each other. Um, we both are philosophers operating in schools that are heavily inflected with arch architectural thinking and um, design innovation. Um, there's lots of... Um, beautiful relationships between the two schools, so I don't think of it as a rivalry, I think of it as um, a partnership, especially considering our shared ge geography. Um, so a couple of topics that we'll just banter about and I hopefully uh, have you guys pitch in with, uh, with some topics. Um, shall we start then? Let's. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so my, the first thing I suggest that we, we talk about, which I think um, bears examining for both of us um, in terms of our self-image but also in how we present ourselves to, to a mostly architectural crowd um, is how we traveled from philosophy to architecture. How do we find, find ourselves here, right? So, and I'll let you start. Right. I had a one-off invitation to the Architectural Association in London back in 2007. That came from 
Theo Lawrence and Tanya Ziems, and I'm still in contact with them. Um, one of the notable things of that day is before I gave my lecture, they had me sit on a review, and that was the first time I'd ever done it, and I had no idea what I was doing. Uh, it's really a, an art form, and it's, I'm, I still don't have it mastered after all these years at SciArc. So that was a, one sort of nerve-wracking thing, but also a learn-by-being-thrown-in-the-water experience. Oh, yeah. um, so that was, the, the, as I said, a one-off um, that didn't really lead to anything. And then in 2011, I was, giving a, I was working in Cairo, Egypt at the time. I happened to take two weeks in New York for a series of lectures there. And David Rue from SciArc, he wasn't at SciArc at the time, he was at Pratt Institute in Brooklyn then, but David Rue was my old undergraduate classmate from the late 1980s, and we hadn't been in touch at all since we graduated. We were never especially close friends. We played a little saxophone together as undergraduates. <laughs> and he showed up and was all about how my philosophy is gonna be very important for architecture, and I had no idea what he was talking about. And we, took me the long way home to the place I was running in New York, and we had a long conversation, and I, I asked him, if I'm gonna be talking to architects, follow conversations and say things without making a complete fool of myself, so can you offer me um, a list of 10 reasonably contemporary books on architecture and 10 classics, just so that I can get my feet wet. Um, you, know, you, you can't master a field by reading 20 books, but you can know enough to know what the different factions are, different camps. And then uh, I got invited to SIARC to lecture in 2013, and then three years later was back at the, as, on the faculty, and I've been there, this is my seventh year at SIARC. And it's been amazing, because the thing you should want to do in intellectual life is make sure you're always a student. And being in an architectural school, I am very much the student. I'm spending a lot of time in the library reading classic sources. I, I know my way enough around that I actually wrote a book just on architecture last, last summer, and that would have been unthinkable even six years ago, so it's been quite a journey. Well, this is wonderful. We, we hadn't um, had much of a background check, so, so to speak, with a lot of these questions, so I find it fascinating that you find, found yourself thrown off the deep end of the architecture review. That's how the love affair for, uh, started for me. Um, Pratt Institute in New York about probably 15 years ago almost. A friend of mine was teaching there, and he invited me, he, and I said, well, I'm a philosopher, you know, and also a PhD student. What am I to do? And he said, oh, precisely, we have a lesbian poet. We have Rem. Um, a couple of uh, architecture students are on the architecture review. And we might be able to use a philosopher. <laughs> um, lovely. And you know, it was you know, uh, five, uh, I mean, learning the fast way, right? I mean, in stride. And I'm still learning, of course. You know, As you said, it's, a, it's an art form all its own. The one thing I do as a philosopher is throw, of course, a wrench you know, when, when the discussion starts. But, I also try to remind everyone that it's a celebration of students' work, right? So um, we forget that it's a, it's a form of pageantry, right? And there's, there's some spectacle to it, and it, is, it could be spectacular, but very often nervousness prevents people from sitting out front instead of being in the back of the audience. Uh, the only thing you risk around here is to have your mind corrupted, but it will happen no matter where you sit. There's still, there's a lot of seats. I'm, I'm serious, I'm inviting everyone, please, come on. Um, um, so, were you ever seduced by architecture? Or do you I, consider yourself seduced? Uh, sure, any subject you become interested in requires a certain amount of seduction. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know how much we want to go into the philosophy on that, but there's a lot I've written about seduction. Yeah, yeah. Uh, which I picked up, uh, Everyone knows what the word means. It was brought into philosophy most pointedly by Jean Baudrillard, uh, who wrote a book on simulation and another famous book on seduction. And Baudrillard was maybe one of the least known influences on the origin of object-oriented ontology. He was the first author I got really into in graduate school. I had a very classical undergraduate background, mm -hmm. went very contemporary in my early years of graduate school. And Baudrillard uh, talks about objects in a way that wasn't common for that era of French philosophers, and mm -hmm. the seductive force uh, uh, objects, and especially simulations, have on the human subject. And in object-oriented ontology, where, where that kind of seduction becomes prominent is in its theory of aesthetics, and Rosen's a mastermind when it comes to aesthetics, has read a lot in the field, uh, so maybe we want, we want to save some of that for later, but um, it's, it's, when people ask what object-oriented ontology about, is about, or if you go to ChatGPT and ask what object-oriented ontology oh, is no. about, and ChatGPT is not as bad as some people think. Some of those answers are pretty good. It would probably say object-oriented ontology is the theory that objects hide from direct human access, 
that, that's true, but you can also find that in Kant, you can find that in Heidegger. It's not especially unique. Mm -hmm. uh, what object oriented ontology is really about is the tension between an object and its own qualities. And there's a paradox here because how do you define an object by the qualities it has? And yet an object also changes qualities. Mm -hmm. And as I see it, there are also two kinds of objects and two kinds of qualities. So you actually have four different tensions going on. And anytime you're dealing with a real object, you're dealing with something deeper than any possible human knowledge or any possible access to it. And so it's, it's something that, that seduction is one word, hiding is another word. Um, it's missing, and that has to be replaced by the human beholder. And this is why for me, unlike for many people who like formalism as I do, I think the human uh, beholder, human spectator is vital to the arts. There has to be someone there getting involved with the qualities of the artwork or else it's not really art. You know, I didn't mean to go on that long, Relson. Oh no, it's lovely. And also, how about we just got a quick um, brush up on something called Triple O, which is one of your many claims to fame, but also one of the reasons that we're all unsettled by Graham's uh, intelligence. Um, I think of you as a world builder, and part of it is because the, your brand of realism is, the, is the definitively game changer. Um, and it makes a lot of people nervous and a lot of people excited, right? Which is, which is par partially um, why architects are a part of the conversation. Um, in preparing for tonight, I, was oh, I asked myself, well, what about my seduction or how, when was I seduced by architecture? And I remember distinctly reading something called Wuthering Heights, which is one of those 19th century novels. I remember nothing, nothing except the description of the house. Nothing. You could convince me that there's, you know, 15 uh, minions uh, playing, jumping around that house. I could care less who, who dies or who is whose friend. It's only about, and so I reread that first chapter where they described the house, and it's just as potent, and it just it, 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 it irreducibly architectural um, somehow for me, right? And again, I mean, imagine uh, the horror that would be for the, if the author had to suffer this kind of feedback, right? <laughs> Um, so, oh wait, hey, there's a Kate Bush song also, right? So I do think of that um, uh, when I think of Wuthering Heights. Um, this is what I meant by seduction. Did you have a moment? Was, did you have a sort of like an architectural eureka or, you know? Um, um, that's a good question. And it might have happened before my specific engagement intellectually with architecture. <laughs> The first book, let's say the first architectural treatise I really was seduced by was Aldo Rossi's Architecture of the City. Mm. And that's still one of the ones that means the most to me. And I think the, the pa famous pages on the critique of naive functionalism, the fact that in Italy, where he's from especially, um, many buildings have changed their uses many times mm. over the centuries and there are monuments that never had any particular use. And I just found that to be such a wonderful uh, way of looking at buildings, that they're something that outlasts any context. And hmm. of course at SciArc, I learned today, same, this is somewhat true of this campus as well. You were saying CalArts was here at one point, and yeah. we have a former monastery that's now the library. Yep. Of course SciArc um, was originally a freight depot for the Santa Fe Railroad over 100 years ago now. And then I knew it had stayed abandoned for a long time and that homeless were living in there. They'd pulled some dead bodies out of there mm -hmm. just because of the kind of people, the transients who were taking shelter there. But then the chapter I learned it, uh, accidentally was that I, an Uber driver one day told me he used to pay the homeless to leave for a night to hold raves in there. So it was also a, a rave site. Um, anyway, Syarch being one of those buildings where you can't really pinpoint the function as architecture school or as freight rail station. The function is somehow deeper than any particular relation it has. The, f the, f the deep function of SciArc is something like lengthy horizontal movement along a narrow corridor, which has an impact on how it functions today as a school. For example, Hernan, our director, jokes that he doesn't need to schedule meetings. All he has to do is walk from one end of the school to the other, and he runs into everybody anyway, because there's not really any place to hide except a couple of areas that have mm -hmm. things on the side. But for the most part, if you want to avoid anyone at SciArc, you have to go outside and walk outside and come back in the other entrance because it's the spatially organized in such a strange way. Um, architecturally, I, you know, it's, one runs the risk of being naive around architects, like when I'm at SciArc, I, I prefer to listen to them talk about their favorite mm -hmm. buildings. Some of the ones that I have liked, well, I'm, I'm a 
I really liked the uh, Alexandria Library in, when it opens, the new Alexandria Library in uh, Alexandria. Jean Nouvelle, right? Yeah. It's actually Snohetta. Oh, so, oh okay. Yeah, yeah and uh, uh, Alexandria is a two and a half hour train trip from Cairo, and it was a, a fresh air getaway because Cairo is fairly polluted. It's an exciting city, 24 hour city, but it, not clean air. Mm -hmm. Alexandria has the fresh breezes, and all the colors are pretty. And it's the kind of place artists would want to paint, I think. Mm -hmm. and so I used to go up and spend time in that library, and I found out that was Snohetta, and then it. It turns out that I really liked their Oslo Opera House as well, and, mm. and part of it was that the um, it was a place that people in Oslo were gravitating to. to. Um, mm -hmm. There's a kind of ramp-like thing on one side, and people would hang out up there. There's yeah. something kind of below roof level at the end of the ramp, and that people are hanging out there. It's something that people enjoy spending time at. So that was one. I'm also a, a sucker for the Sydney Opera House, and I think professional architects, there are admirers, and then there are others who don't admire it quite as much. And mm. what, I, what I love about the Sydney Opera House is that you can remember the form, right? I don't mm. like it when there are especially computer-generated forms that are so complex. It's like Rene Descartes said about trying to imagine a million-sided figure, was it? Or was it a 10,000-sided mm -hmm. figure? Yeah. You can't really remember a 10,000-sided figure as opposed to a 12,000-sided figure. They're, they're both so complex, they're almost circular. Yeah. And I often find myself saying this to SciArc students at reviews, is that what I love about your form in this project is that I'll be able to sketch it from memory tomorrow, more or less. It's, uh, it's simple enough to remember, but unique enough not to be confused with other things. Um, you're edging onto con the controversial territory of formalism, but before we go there, we can talk about formalism in, um, in philosophical discourse. And you and I have had a little bit of a chat about this. Um, essentially, we're on the same page with our, the impatience uh, we have for what I call uh, the clarity fetish mm -hmm. in philosophy, right? So, um, and I love reading about it um, in the pages of your books. Um, by the way, Henry, 23 books. It's 24 as of yesterday. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. <clears throat> Lots of muscle on this stage. Um, um, we tend to alienate inadvertently or, or and very often um, intentionally, we t tend to alienate our audiences. And this was part of the issue for me when I started uh, grad school in philosophy. And you and I have read impossible to read um, um, philosophical literature where it's, uh, the, the literature basically dies somewhere you know, in the middle of the sentence. Um, I could name uh, authors, but this of course creates more controversy. Uh, my opposite um, example is Stanley Cavell, who I treasure as a thinker and a writer and stylist, um, who starts one of his books with a 200-word sentence, right? And of course, for, all, for a lot of us, this is a lot, a lot of a price of admission, but it actually coheres. And part of it, part of the sense of the sentence has a lot to do with, with that length and with the sort of luxuriating grammatically, right? And so... Um, I wonder how it is for you as a, as a writer and as a thinker, and when, the, when you arrive to, to these intuitions that are now convictions. Um, my main rule when writing anything is to not write any sentence if I wouldn't dare say it out loud. I have to imagine myself saying it in out loud in front of an audience like this, and if I feel them getting bored as I go through the sentence, I change it up somehow. And if, I don't always succeed at that. I'm sure I've written some boring sentences or some, some tangled ones, but that's my goal at least. Um, I think what's happened is in the modern period, people have lost respect for rhetoric, and that's wrong. I mean, the ancient Greeks and Romans put a lot of time into this. Aristotle spent half the day teaching his students rhetoric, and philosophers today, when they think of rhetoric, think of sophistry. We've got to stop the sophists from tricking people, but that's, no, when, when philosophers talk about clarity, all right, clarity is better than unclarity many times, but um, when they talk about clarity, I think they mean something clear that could be understood by a computer. And that's not who reads philosophy. It's humans who read philosophy, which means you need to have some rhetorical pull that keeps them paying attention. And so it's good to make a slightly shocking statement every now and then. This is why it's good to avoid cliches or, mm. or twist around a cliche a little bit so people have to pause and think about something. They have to move through it at not too quickly a speed. And... Um, uh, Clarity is not enough. Vividness is needed. And by vividness, I mean, or even lucidity, something that engages the reader. And there are, there's a lot of clear philosophy out there that's simply too boring to read. That I start reading it and saying, this is clear, but I'm not following any of it. I can't remember anything they said. You know, we do find ourselves in a bind. And I, I, I'm all there with you um, in terms of 
the merit of vividness as opposed to clarity, right? And also the necessity for it when trying to speak of these very abstract notions and to try to get a grasp um, with enough humility that the truth might be out of, out of reach. Um, but this is where the, you know, the pickle is because you get to basically announce yourself as a humble journey person rather than a seeker of truth. Because the clarity fetish ties very nicely with the seeking of truth and with that sort of dogged pursuit of right. whatever is supposed to be definitive. So in a sense, we're humble in our enterprise, but then we're very, very exuberant in our expression. Okay. The, the, w one of the things that's always bothered me about the supposed search for truth in philosophy is the people who say that the most are the ones who think they already have the truth. So it becomes kind of a political dogmatic claim mm -hmm. when they talk about truth. Okay. It's the right to legislate to you. And of course, the meaning of philosophy, philosophia means the love of wisdom. It doesn't mean wisdom. And Socrates, if you read Plato's dialogues carefully, never gives a successful definition of anything. He manages to undercut some weak definitions of things. And this is why I think it's been really wrong-headed to try to model philosophy after the natural sciences for the last 400 years. Obviously, the natural sciences have been incredibly successful promoting the well-being of the human race, and negative things too in other cases. But it, the scientific revolution may be the most important thing that ever happened in history, but uh, that doesn't mean philosophy is cut from the same cloth or needs to be doing the same thing. And this is why I've come around to the view that aesthetics is maybe the closest field to philosophy. It should be at the heart of philosophy because it's about that which cannot be paraphrased, that which cannot be restated in literal terms. Hmm. You know when I, I mean, I love the, um, it's a very rudimentary description, uh, stems from the etymology of the word, right? I mean, the love of wisdom. But I love thinking about doing philosophy as the love for the love of wisdom. Right, as that sort of almost like second degree um, mm. enterprise, because you and I do wear our heart on our sleeve when it comes to our love for the enterprise, right? Mm. And so to do philosophy is one thing, but to love doing it is another. And I think at that point, you might um, be loosen up a little bit, I think, in terms of both the humility. I mean, there was this quote from uh, Joseph uh, Befford where he describes you in a kind of semi ridiculous m manner. Um, he, he calls you a self-declared na naive met metaphysician. Um, and then I think you laugh it off in, the, in your response. I mean, it's on the, page, on the pages of a recent book. Um, but, you know, when I hear naive and the sort of self-declared, right, I mean, the, the, the uh, outlines of a self-image, I associate it with the humility of pursuing wisdom rather than having it at hand or claiming it for all to see, right? Yeah, I think, I think Joseph meant well in that case, but uh -huh. yes, yeah, yeah, yes yeah. If, yeah. if he were asking me, would that be my self-description? I don't mind naive, but naive, usually the word naive in philosophy pops up in the phrase naive realism. So in mm -hmm. other words, anyone who believes in an external world is somehow being naive, and you have to go through all these complicated maneuvers to reach a special transcendental position where you're sort of doubting the existence of the world or bracketing it. And um, No, I'm not a fan of that approach, because that approach basically is saying that the relation between thought and world is the only relation we can really talk about in philosophy. You can't talk about the relation between fire and cotton, the, the title of this event, the famous Islamic philosophy example. You have to talk about how the fire-cotton relation appears to humans. Mm -hmm. And that's Kant's doing, and Kant is a great philosopher, and we all owe him a lot. But uh, the, the biggest difference between object-oriented ontology and Kant and Heidegger is object-oriented ontology says it's not just that reality hides from humans. Reality of objects hides from other objects. Mm. And uh, I think, you know, for Kant, the fact that reality hides from us is some special tragic human burden that only humans are saddled with. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I don't see it that way. I think when two things causally interact, they don't causally interact with the full depth of each other. So fire burning cotton, the fire interacts with the flammable properties of the cotton, however we want to describe those. It doesn't interact with all the other properties. Mm. And the same with the cotton to the fire. And so that's a, that's a fact of all relations. It's not fa a fact about human thoughts. And so I think that's, that's what we need. And that's not going completely unnoticed. Alfred North Whitehead's big move in metaphysics in the 20th century, 1920s is when he flourished, was to say all relations are on the same footing. We can't just start with the thought world relation and limit ourselves to that. Mm -hmm. But it's also worth noting that as famous as Whitehead is, 
he doesn't really fit in either of the dominant traditions, the analytic or the continental. Neither of them mm -hmm. fully claims him. And in fact, uh, um, the guy who wrote the big purple Cambridge history of modern metaphysics, what's, why am I blanking on his name right now? But anyway, he, it's as ecumenical a book as you can possibly have. It has Bergson and Deleuze, it has Carnap. So he's trying mm -hmm, to cover everything. Mm -hmm. No chapter on Whitehead, one of the major metaphysicians in all human history. So I think he just doesn't fit because I think the two, the two branches of contemporary philosophy are united around this idea that in order to be rigorous, we're all talking about how things appear to human thoughts. Yeah, That's the yeah. starting point of everything. Well, I mean, a couple of disclaimers here, and I'm not in the position to make them um, elegantly because it's uh, this is Graham um, Harmon's you know claim to fame, um, well among many, but certainly uh, triple O. Um, but one disclaimer is that when we talk about objects, we're already lifted up from what we normally consider um, as an object, right? So it's not a, some kind of crude materialism. Alice in Wonderland is an object, right? The book, the story, Alice mm -hmm. herself, right? And and then another disclaimer is that relations between objects then also could become uh, could become an object, which I think uh, coheres very nicely with the uh, uh, lyrics of a Bjork song. Anybody listen to Bjork? Um, I, I was I was going to quiz you about this. So I mean, I'm, I think very often about pop music, and I think through pop music, I actually learned English through pop music. So if, uh, eventually, you hear a little bit of a um, uncredited quote here and there. Um, so th there's this song where she goes. Um, our love is a ball of yarn, and the de when, when you're away, the devil um, unravels it, and so we can make new love once we, you know, uh, reconnect, something like that. I mean, this is a loose interpretation. The song is called Unravel. But I've always had a sense that, you know, a romantic relationship is a third object. Yeah, any relationship at all. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, H2O, right? Th this is why we say water is emergent beyond hydrogen and oxygen. It has properties that those uh -huh. chemicals don't, and sure, a marriage, right? Neither partner controls a marriage. It's, it, it pushes back on both partners in some way. And that's true of any real relation, I would say. Yeah. Well, this, I mean, uh, we have, as I said, a couple of these sort of like broader topics. And one of them has to be beauty, and especially, you know, beauty as it relates to architecture. Hopefully, if you can get that far or, you know, uh, that specific. Um, I did have when I, I mean, I have a sense that y the way you speak about beauty there is a poetic reference in your uh, conversations about beauty between the irreducibility of an object and also the irreducibility of the aesthetic experience. Mm -hmm. And another pop song, which is a, an example for me, you guys, if you haven't heard it, you owe it to yourself. You're so vain, Carly Simon, 1971, important. Um, right, so the, the issue there is that we don't know who ends up being so vain, right? So, and then there's been a 50-year investigation. And you could look it up, there's books written about it. Um, all kinds of, I mean, I, I always felt it was about me, the song. Um, <laughs> but it's an anachronistic in terms of my life path. Um, the issue here is that, you know, the way Graham speaks, speaks about beauty, and I, this is what I hear in your philosophy, I'm, I'm curious if, you know, you confirm or, you know, elaborate, then we can get closer to architecture. The issue being that uh, you cannot just simply reduce the song to the gossip and to the to the actual reference of whoever person happens to be the you, the you know literary uh, you, um, on the one hand, and on the other, you cannot also um, ascend to some kind of, of sweeping generalization of saying this is a feminist statement that is typical of 1971, and and sort of um, get away so far away, tragically away uh, from the object. Right, mm -hmm. so there's there's a there's a level of inscrutability or re irreducibility that makes that song that song. I'm just curious if that if, if you find this to be a sure. And we're we're kind of getting back into the aesthetic difference, say between Kant and Hegel. To, to oversimplify, for Kant's basically a formalist aesthetically, which means the artwork is cut off from any meaning it has. It's cut off from any good or bad feeling it gives you. It's cut off from use. That's why he doesn't like mm -hmm. architecture. Um, the, uh, the art object is supposed to be self-contained. It's not even supposed to have an inherent relation to the spectator, the beholder. Whereas for Hegel, every artwork is simply an expression of the culture from which it arose, its time and mm -hmm, place. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, I gravitate a little more towards the first view, primarily because you can transport objects and works of art to different contexts, and they still have comparable force. However, um, I wouldn't say that objects have no interaction with their surroundings. I would just say it's a finite number of interactions. Mm -hmm. So when I see a student project in, in architecture, and this also happens in art, and they say my work is site specific, what you find when you look at that is that it, it can't interact with all of the aspects of a site. 
Mm -hmm. A site is infinite inherently. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so the project is always choosing a half dozen or so features of the site to interact with it most. And it's somehow embracing those while closing off others. Mm. But uh, it has to do work to, in to close, some off, close some off and embrace others. It takes labor to do that. Mm. And so I don't think either the socio-political reading of an artwork or a purely formalist one will work for that reason. Mm. Uh, I also think that you cannot exclude the spectator from any work. Uh, this is in my book, Art and Objects. This was my objection to Michael Fried, someone I admire a lot, mm. a friend of Stanley Cavell. Uh -huh. um, uh, that um, uh, Fried, like Kant, is against theatricality in arts. He doesn't think that the thinks there should be the, the necessary fiction that the painting isn't act interacting with the spectator at all, which is an obvious lie because there would be no paintings if there were no one to look at them. Mm. But um, uh, I, th I think the union between the beholder and the artwork can itself close off from other relations. That's the sense in which formalism is true. The fact that there's this kind of, just like hydrogen and oxygen close themselves off to make water and don't interact with all the stuff around them, it kind of creates this inner space. I think the same thing happens between the, the beholder and the artwork. You have just diagnosed me, uh, mm -hmm. my relationship with pop music. Um, so I'm curious when you say aesthetics is about the tension between, I mean, you mentioned it earlier, but I, you know, an elaboration could right. be helpful, especially as we go, get closer to architecture. We will eventually, I mean, hey, we were just talking about architecture projects and site-specific work. Mm -hmm. um, um, but uh, when you say that it's aesthetics is about the, uh, the tension between the, op the uh, object and its qualities, yes. how do you mean it? Maybe an example or two? Um, yeah. Sure. Uh, the philosophical source for this is British empiricism, especially Hume, who, as you know, <laughs> talks about objects as being just bundles of qualities. Yeah, yeah. So he says, we never really saw anything called an apple. We see red, round, hard, juicy, sweet, cold, and we see those qualities come together so often that we kind of invent this nickname apple for these qualities uh -huh. that come together all the time. And that, that has had a quiet, dominating influence on most philosophy since. Now, the, the great exception to this is phenomenology, because Edmund Husserl wanted to analyze the way objects appear to us. One of the first things he noticed is, I rotate the apple in my hand, and I'm seeing different qualities all the time. I'm seeing it at different distances, different amounts of light, mm. but I'm still seeing the same apple. And so there's something called apple that is deeper than the specific qualities we're seeing at any moment. He calls those adumbrations. Mm. And um, so I think Husserl is one of those philosophers who discovered you can cut a rift between an object and its qualities. Hmm. Aristotle noticed this very early in the history of philosophy. He said that Socrates and Socrates standing and Socrates sitting down, they're all the same person, hmm. uh, right? Because it's still Socrates. That's what he calls a substance. And now that's been seen as a kind of middle-aged and boring insight that people don't like mm -hmm. anymore. But there's really something there. The fact that an object is in tension with its own qualities. Even if there are certain qualities an object needs that it can't lose without becoming some something totally different. So at a certain point, I'll decide, oh, this wasn't an apple, it was a peach. And you bite into it and it tastes wrong. So there, there are certain vaguely defined limits an object cannot cross and still be the same object, but there is very much a tension there. And the way that fits into triple O aesthetics is that I interpret aesthetics as being a case where unlike, let me first say, if you ask people what's the opposite of, of the beautiful, most people would say the ugly. Mm -hmm. I say no, the opposite of the beautiful is the literal because the ugly, in a way, is just a, an unpleasant cousin of the, of the beautiful. Uh -huh. They're both aesthetic experiences. You react with a lot of emotion with, to both beautiful and ugly things. Literal experience. With appreciative uh, potential, yeah. Yeah, and so a literal statement for me is when you make a statement about something. And um, uh, there's a couple of things you can notice. I, I often talk about metaphor because that's maybe the easiest example to explain, mm -hmm. even easier than visual arts. What, what is the difference between a metaphorical statement and a literal statement? And I came up with two. One of them is um, you, you, can, you can reverse a literal statement. You can't reverse a metaphorical statement. So you can say a pen is like a pencil, or a pencil is like a pen. Right? They're both long, skinny writing instruments, hmm. not too expensive, dark color. Um, but if you say if you, Homer, Homer's poem in the Odyssey, Wine Dark Sea, you can also say sea dark wine. But those are not the same statement. They're both metaphors. Mm -hmm. Because in the first case, wine dark sea, the sea is the subject and it has wine qualities. The other one, the wine is the subject that has sea qualities. So that points to an asymmetry in aesthetic discourse and that points to the object quality rift. Mm -hmm. You've got an object and then you've got qualities belonging to it. The other one, of course, is that metaphors can't be too close or too far away from the truth and work as metaphors. So pen is like a pencil. 
you know, some Dadaist genius could make that work as a metaphor given enough context, but it, most, most of us do, do not see that as an aesthetic statement. We see that as a literal comparison mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because all you're looking at is that the two have the sa similar qualities. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then uh, my favorite example of one that doesn't work because it's too distant is drinking a milkshake is like drawing an isosceles triangle. And again, a, a Dadaist genius could do something with this in poetry maybe, but most of the time you're going to say, what? Yeah. It's not going to work as an aesthetic experience for you. The, it works when the, when the things are somewhat similar, mm -hmm. but just dissimilar enough that the identity is not compelling and you have to pass beyond the level of qualities. So in Homer's case, calling the Mediterranean the wine dark sea. Well, it sort of works because there might be some vague color similarity between some wine and the Mediterranean sea. Mm. But what that, what's really going on there is that the color is a, a pretext to assert a kind of false identity between the wine and the sea. And so when you talk about a wine dark sea, you're not just imagining a sea that's the same color. You're also imagining a sea that's laced with intoxication and danger and adventure and oblivion and whatever else we might associate with wine. And what happens there is the sea is the object, the wine qualities are the qualities, mm -hmm. but since the, the wine dark sea is not a sea we can perceive in literal terms because we don't know what that is, we, we don't ever literally encounter a wine-like sea, yeah. all real objects disappear, right, because they're deeper than their relations. So the sea is vanished in that metaphor, and we are left with these wine dark qualities that have to be attached to something. But that real object, the sea, is gone because, precisely because it's real. Right? It, real objects, for me, can never be directly touched because they're deeper than any model we make of them. Mm -hmm. And then um, there's really only one real object left on the scene that can support those wine qualities, and that is I myself, as the reader of the poem. I myself have to perform that very difficult entity called the wine dark sea. Mm -hmm. I become a kind of method actor, mm -hmm. like where mm -hmm. you be a rock, and you have to pretend you're a rock. And, um, and this is why I think the, the origins of the arts are probably in performance. Mm -hmm. And this was my big dis disagreement with Freed. Um, they, you know, we, we talk about the oldest art being cave paintings because that's the oldest stuff that's preserved. You know, all the way back, what, 60,000 years now in Chauvet, we'll probably find older ones. We don't find any masks uh, because they're not going to last long enough, right? Mm -hmm. the leather or whatever they're made of. But I had this strange experience. Um, where some years ago, as a graduate student in Chicago, I was invited to a Halloween costume party. I left it too long, I was procrastinating, and so I find myself shopping for a costume at like 3 p.m. on Halloween day, go into a costume store. The only half-decent costume left is this really creepy zebra mask from Tanzania that has these smoky patterns around the eyes. It looked like a zebra that had risen from the dead. And so I got that, and then I took a black turtleneck, put white adhesive tape stripes on it, so I was kind of like the anti-zebra made of antimatter, and I went and I won the prize for best costume a few hours later. But the, the moral of the story is at one point I was visiting my parents in Iowa, I left the mask at their house, and they put it in a locked glass cabinet at their house, and one time I was back visiting, and I said, oh yeah, I remember this, and I put it back on. My parents' two dogs went berserk, barking like I was a monster. And these dogs have known me since they were puppies. They know my smell, which is the most important thing for dogs, right? But they were barking at me like they had rabies. That having this scary zebra mask was a mortal threat to them. And one of them eventually jumped from the side and knocked it off my head. Mm. And this is what made me realize the, the uh, deep roots that theater has in us mm. as perhaps the most visceral of the art forms. Mm. Kant doesn't really write about theater because he can't. He, he imagines mm -hmm. calm, disinterested observation. Mm -hmm. It's Aristotle who talks about catharsis mm -hmm. as really in some ways the essence of art. Yeah. And so in a way, a Aristotle might be the first anti-formalist mm. because the emotional reactions brought about in us by theater for him are the key. Yeah. Something you said reminded me of Peter Kivy, a philosopher that is treasured in the um, aesthetics community. Mm -hmm. Um, he wrote a paper where he tried to defend uh, the thesis that we could paraphrase, po paraphrase, paraphrase poetry, which obviously on your view is an impossibility, and also I, I would agree very much. Yeah, here I'm with, um, in literary criticism, Cleanth Brooks writes about this. He writes about how you can't paraphrase a poem, mm. and that was back in the 1940s. And then in philosophy, Max Black in the analytic tradition, mm -hmm, Jose mm -hmm. Ortega y Gasset in the continental tradition, talk about this. Th th it's just like a, trying to put a three-dimensional globe onto a two-dimensional map. Mm -hmm. You have to distort the shape or size of the continents. Yeah. And just try it sometime. Try taking a metaphor and spelling out what it means in prose. You're never going to get it quite right. The better the metaphor, the harder it's going to be. Mm 
And there are other things like that that are not literal, such as jokes. Mm -hmm. Explain any joke in prose, you've just ruined it. Sometimes you have to, right? Mm -hmm. You tell a joke, somebody says, I don't get it, you have to explain it. Yeah. And another of my favorite examples is magic tricks, uh, because there's an unspoken rule, or maybe spoken rule among professional magicians, you never tell lay people how uh -huh, the tricks uh -huh. were done. It ruins the profession, right? They tell each other how to do the trick. Ah, last one, threats. Uh, the famous, gonna make him an offer he can't refuse of the Godfather. Try replacing that with, I'm gonna cut off his horse's head and put it in his bed at night, which is grotesque, but it's not nearly as scary as, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. as that, or I often mention Dick Cheney's threat to Iraq in the first Gulf War, which uh, I know he's, he's not a popular figure in the intellectual world, but uh, he, there, were, there were rumors, some of you were alive then, the first Gulf War, and there were these rumors that Saddam Hussein was planning to use chemical weapons against mm -hmm, the American mm -hmm. soldiers. And reportedly, Cheney sent a telegram to Saddam Hussein that said, a horrible statement, but a great threat, uh, was if, if Iraq uses chemical weapons on U.S. soldiers, the United States will respond promptly and decisively in a manner from which it will take Iraq centuries to recover. Now, that's a lot scarier than saying, if you use chemical weapons, we're going to use nuclear weapons. That's just like a bragger. It's one-upping. So I'm tougher than you. If you, you know, if you punch me once, I'll punch you twice. That somehow Cheney's statement was yeah. horrific in many ways, but exquisitely crafted as a threat. That's right. how threats right. work. Mm. They're supposed to be mm. left vague. And a lot of other language works like that. Hinting at things is somehow often more powerful than stating it outright. Yeah, where, where, and that's where the subtlety in, in taste, I mean, well, not in taste, in style comes in. Right. Um, so I wanted to get closer to architecture. You're a mm -hmm. defendant, and probably not very popular as such, defendant of exuberant and spectacular architecture. Um, now, I spent a semester talking about the, uh, the froth relationship um, uh, contemporary architecture, well, modern, postmodern, and contemporary architecture has with beauty, and with the notion of beauty, but also with embodying it um, in my philosophy of architecture class. So um, some of these controversies are very well known. I mean, the tension, for example, in towards a new architecture, um, Le Corbusier's uh, famous manifesto, I probably call it, the tension between the poetic and the crudely machinic, right? Um, I mean, one can be read as, a, as an, um, mm -hmm iteration of the, above the other, but they could also be regarded as um, sort of a clash. Um, but there's many other other uh, controversies of that sort. I'm curious why you love spectacular architecture. Well, uh, I do have some sympathy for the political critiques that are made of star architects and not spending enough time on housing for the poor worldwide and not dealing enough with climate change. I think all those things are, are apt. However, um, that kind of critique can easily go too far. Like um, imagine someone saying, there's so many starving people in the world, how can we dare have Michelin restaurants open, right? We m these should all be closed and we should focus entirely on serving them. Or we, sh we should stop showing operas because they're highbrow and snobbish. We should only have musicals that mm -hmm. everyone can understand. Or mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You could do that to literature, you could do that to philosophy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, well there's, obviously we need sometimes to speak to wider audiences. But uh, the world also has a place for high culture. And in fact, right now, I think high, high culture is harder and harder to find. Um, so, uh, you know, for example, Bob Dylan wins the Nobel Prize for Literature. Mm -hmm. and, and, okay, fine, you can make the case for that, but we're already there. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. it seems like we're kind of beating a dead horse if we say there's too much snobbery in around, around, because in a way, there's not that much snobbery left. Um, you know, there's already chairs of literature where people are studying comic books and things like this. That's mm -hmm. totally fine now in academia. Yeah. And that's opened things up, and that's great. But, but uh, I don't think maybe the problem isn't snobbery anymore. Maybe the problem is a relative lack of high culture. And, mm. uh, or again, why, why invent metaphors when you should just be speaking to people in plain English? That's kind of a similar argument, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Say things that everyone can understand. So I think it's important to have certain people who are creating experiences that are uh, a little edgy compared to normal experience or that are maybe appealing to a smaller audience at first. Mm -hmm. um, so I have nothing against avant-garde. I don't think everything necessarily needs to be for every audience. Although again, I, d I don't wanna dismiss these political criticisms mm -hmm. because they're as valid in architecture often as they are anywhere else, right? There are, there are, there are many cases where people are focusing too much on one thing while overlooking an enormous urgent need. Well, I mean, part of the humility of your view comes uh, comes from uh, the refusal to to call it a day or to declare full, uh, 
total clarity about how objects operate, mm -hmm. right? And so the withdrawing of the object, right, the, from from scrutiny or from full uh, uh, full understanding, mm -hmm. is something that would apply very um, nicely to the to issues of political impact. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, you've said it before, and I find it very curious. Um, a little bit of a <clears throat> plug for a future book by Graham Harmon, you said it that you, you will eventually tackle politics head on. <laughs> I, I do have a politics book, but it's addressed mostly to covering Bruno Latour's politics, yeah, so you can yeah, find yeah. some of my ideas in there. Yeah. Um, yeah, the basic take I have on politics in print to date is if, if you look at modern political theory, and modern means different things in different fields, modern and political theory means the 1500s to now, hmm. you basically find people either on the left or the right. And as many of us know, that is a fairly recent distinction, going back to the two sides of the assembly in the French Revolution, the more reactionary, the more progressive. Mm -hmm. Now, what does what the difference between left and right boil down to? Ultimately, it boils down to a difference between two views of human nature. So the left tend to be the people who see humans as naturally good or at least improvable, that if we're corrupted, it's because society did it or evil capitalists did it, greedy people did it. Um, unfair legal systems did it, racism did it, and if we just fix all that, we can come back to our kind sharing selves that we had in the Stone Age at some point. Whereas the right tends to see humans as naturally dangerous. We need very severe punishments for anyone who falls out of line. Mm. Warfare is necessary to defend your own people and, and so forth, the things mm. we usually associate with the right. Now what's interesting is that uh, David Graeber and David Wengro recently published this book to a lot of fanfare, The Dawn of Everything, A New History of Humanity. We've unfortunately lost Graeber a couple of years ago, famous anarchist intellectual. And they take on that same distinction that I took on in my book, that you know, you're either going to fall into the Hobbes camp or to the Rousseau camp, and that's kind of boring, and let's try something new. But what they end up with is that humans are neither naturally good nor naturally evil. Humans are naturally imaginative, and that means we can reimagine the political space and experiments. Mm. But what you might have noticed there is that it's just another theory of human nature. Instead of humans being naturally good or naturally evil, we're naturally imaginative. Well, why are we so sure that politics is all about humans when the great political changes often have to do with some new technology, whether it's social media, which messed up the American electoral system in some ways, whether it's factories and the Industrial Revolution creating mass democracy out of that, uh, artificial intelligence, there's another topic uh, that's going to change politics a lot, I think, in ways that are hard to imagine, the smartphone. When I was in Egypt during the revolution, it was Twitter and the smartphone combined mm -hmm. that, that changed politics, allowed me to get real-time in, real information from the people battling on the street, mm. whereas if you re read the news, it would be two days old by the time you got it. So um, I think more, more needs to be said about the role of non-humans in politics, and this wasn't my original idea. This came from Bruno Latour and the, the primatologist Shirley Strum, who's still alive and working at UC San Diego. She's an expert on baboons. She took Latour with her on one of her uh, expeditions. And they, they wrote a very interesting joint article where they pointed out that baboons are actually more social than we are. Baboons are constantly watching each other to see which baboon's at the top of the food chain and has that changed, which baboon is back massaging another back baboon. And they're, they're constantly keeping track of the other baboons and where their own place is. And luckily, human life is not that exhausting, right? So, uh, I come here, I know that I have a home to go to tonight, I know that I have a job to go back to on Tuesday, I know roughly what's in my bank account, my name, my social security number, my age and what that means in terms of my eventual retirement and, and health issues and so forth. Uh, and so in a way, uh, Latour and Strum make the case that inanimate objects stabilize human society. And that has good and bad effects, right? It's good that we don't have to worry about your identity each and every day constantly. But it also means people get frozen in certain social classes or frozen in certain routines, so there's that too. And I think one reason people don't want to hear so much about non-human things in politics is because that's often associated with the right, or at least with geopolitical realism, because people think of the geographical interpretation of history when they think of non-human things. So, mm -hmm. um, for instance, um, England's foreign policy being a result of the fact that it's an island which is actually probably true, right? The fact that the British have always had large navies and smaller armies because they're not really in danger of being invaded by a 300,000 person army. Mm -hmm. They, you know, they have this sea-based empire. And, and um, so things like that will tend to uh, solidify countries' foreign policies over the centuries, even when the 
people in power change. Mm -hmm. So Iran, there's a country whose regime has completely changed since the mid-1970s, and yet they have certain foreign policy interests. Some have changed, but some of their foreign policy interests uh, are the same as they always were, just because of where Iran is as a country, mm -hmm. their neighbors, their natural rivals, natural enemies, natural friends. And so um, I think people think that the ge since the geographical interpretation of history often leads to this kind of cold-hearted realpolitik where you just have to defend national interests, um, they don't see that as anything new in a way that it is. It is actually new because the objects of interest can change. Um, most Egyptians grew up with Israel as the national enemy for obvious reasons. Mm -hmm. That's going to shift. Egypt's not going to be able to worry about Israel because Egypt's going to have to worry about water supplies. Mm -hmm. Egypt's going to be maybe the natural enemy of Sudan and Ethiopia in the coming 30 years. And so objects of interest can change. And of course, climate politics is the ultimate proof of this. The fact that mm -hmm. CO2 and methane are now major political actors mm -hmm. that we all have to come to terms with, just like we have to come to terms with Putin or Kim Jong-un. They're not humans, but they're there. Yeah. Um, you ran away with this. Uh, but I do not mm. begrudge you. Um, there's a, a, a yet another full topic that I was hoping that we get to broach. So um, we'll just go over a little bit because be, we're about to be wrapping up and, and open it to questions. But uh, come on, let's just talk about what you and I learned from architecture. I think sure. that that's an important topic, um, both for us, you know, in, in our career paths, but also for our audience. Um, so. Um, you know, when you use the word kickback, right? What is the kickback for you philosophically? You are exposed to architecture. We go to these reviews. Here we are in this room full of designers. Um, they're about to design the hell out of the world we live in, hopefully, mm -hmm. um, and in a pleasant manner. Yeah, uh, one of the things is that I like the greater pressure to innovate in architecture because you guys work with a faster clock than we do in philosophy, where Kant is in some sense a contemporary philosopher. We're mm -hmm. still working within his basic, <laughs> it's 1780s, right? American Revolution, yeah. that's when Kant was writing. Um, and so that's one thing. But I, was, I would say that architecture deals with constraints, and I won't say in a good sense and a bad sense, I'll say in two different good senses. Uh, one of them is that architects have to work with a situation that's given to them usually. You don't have unlimited resources, unlimited land, mm -hmm. unlimited technologies. You have to work with what's available now and what's safe now. And philosophy often behaves as it's just creating worlds out of scratch on paper. Um, the other point about constraints is that architects, since they're innovating their constraints and going past them so often, are more aware of them than we are in philosophy. So again, this, this idea I've been talking about, that all of philosophy is about the thought world relation, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. people haven't really quite conceptualized yet that that's the problem in philosophy, that that's our blinders. Bec because there are all these people claiming to overcome the subject-object duality, but all they're really saying is that there's something mysterious that humans can't get at, like Heidegger. And Heidegger's right. a great philosopher, but that's not the problem. The problem is, why does it have to be something that humans can't get? Why are humans in the middle of your statement from the beginning? Mm -hmm. Why not what happens when fire burns cotton or when a comet hits Jupiter? Well, you've said before that uh, architects think more urgently about objects, and this has been of the paradigm in architecture that we do not have in, in philosophy. How do you mean that? Well, um, first of all, in the obvious sense that architecture consists of physical objects, and that one has to be concerned with their properties in ways mm -hmm. that philosophers aren't always. Philosophers often have a tendency in the modern era to think there's human thought and then there's everything else. Mm -hmm. And that's just mm -hmm. kind of this slab of stuff that resists human thoughts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They don't have to be as concerned about the individual properties, the individual strength and weaknesses of different objects the way architects do. I'm reminded of Schopenhauer where he says that an idea carves out through the principle of individuation, carves out an object out of, out of uh, matter, right? Then yeah. Typical philosophical bias. Yeah, I mean, we were just reading it in our uh, philosophy of architecture class, so there's people that are already maimed by that reading. Um, mm -hmm. He didn't I like architecture either. What is it? Schopenhauer didn't like architecture either. It's, it's a, he's a curious case. You know, I, yeah. I find it very productive to to learn from architecture about spatial relations, and, mm -hmm. and, and um, I don't think that philosophers think spatially. I mean, it's almost like what you're saying in terms of uh, constraints of, mm -hmm. of certain sorts. So. It might be at the level of the sensual, sensual object, sensuous or sensual? Sensual. Sensual object, um, as you mean it, mm -hmm. that we're talking about these spatial properties and such. But um, you get to actually understand philosophical arguments better. Even a diagram already is a leap for certain uh, types of philosophy. Mm -hmm. There's, there was a paper by a, by a very famous aesthetician within, within um, uh, analytic aesthetics 
who was trying to prove that um, architecture had something to do with ethics, right? There's an uh, ethical underpinning. And basically the argument the person made was, oh, architecture is an art, and therefore, just like art, it has ethical properties, right? And they missed the point that architecture is spatial, and, that's, and that is, is its own gnarly um, cluster of interest that potentially could tease out an ethical implication without referring to, to the crutch of um, arthood, right, or art status. Right for architecture, so you could bypass the sort of the obvious or the normative argument, and go for the nature of architecture, so to speak, or at least you know we get slightly closer. Not ever mentioning the word space in defining architecture—that's astonishing. So, Rosen, for you, uh, is there a, a thick dividing line between art and architecture, or are they closer together than that? That's a beautiful question um, and a complicated one. Um, I think it's not thickly divided. Okay. Yeah, I don't think it's thickly divided. I think it's quite porous. I mean, I made the argument, for example, that curators are, are, are artists, and that's quite controversial. It's a, tea, it's a, a storm in the teacup in a certain precinct of philosophy. But essentially, I would, I would you know, bite the bullet and say, yes, you know, architecture isn't. Yeah. I also think curators are artists, and I think we're going to be reminded of this very rudely by ChatGPT, or not, not ChatGPT, uh -huh. the, the <laughs> visual equivalents like uh, uh, Dali, because at some, I think we're headed towards a period when intellectuals are curators of computer-generated content more than anything else. And that might seem like it's no longer art or architecture, but that's what was said about, why do I always blank on this woman's name? She was a famous producer of wooden sculptures in the early 60s. She was Mary something or other, I think. She was one of the first to hire carpenters to make her artworks for her. And mm -hmm. at first the reaction was, she's not an artist anymore, right? Mm -hmm. she's, yeah. she's hiring other people to do it. Well, obviously she's an artist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the same is going to be true for people who find just the right wording for, mm. for Dali to create a painting. Or uh, what, what's the mid-journey, mid is that the name of it, uh -huh. that architects use? I saw some incredible uh, AI-generated work uh, in our first semester studio last December. And so I think we're probably going to have to work with it rather than denying that it's there. Yeah, it's curious. Tim Morton recently... Uh, posted something on Twitter that had to do with how we could circumvent it from by human means, how we, we could circumvent the technology. But I think that the broader point that you make is the interplay rather than the circumventing or the, you know, the, the conquering, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, the conquest work, work works both ways, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, I know this could have been much, much more bloody considering that there's two quite contentious individuals on stage. Mm -hmm. We are trained to be contentious, right? I mean, we go to these conferences and people walk out and they're screaming and everything. But please bring it. Now it's time for questions. So um, you get to say anything. Um, and some of the brightest people I know on this planet are in this room. So um, let's just, There's I guess, pass a mic around. Yeah. Paulette, yeah, go ahead. Do I have a mic going around? Yeah. Do I need a mic? Yeah. We can hear you. <laughs> 
Yeah, that's why I'm also not a formalist, even though I'm more sympathetic to some of its basic claims than many people. I don't think it works, and uh, primarily because it needs the beholder or spectator uh, as part of the artwork, which means you're already going outside of the work. And then there are other arguments against it, like Harold Bloom's argument that every artist is really wrestling with a past work and trying to change it into some form that's theirs. And so ultimately, I don't think you can completely cut works off from each other or even objects off from each other. But yeah. Well, it does work, it's not, in common sense, perhaps, even highly ranked on the aesthetic scale. Yes, although I think not all of the causal labor that goes into producing an object is necessarily retained in the object, right? So this, this is where I differ from some contextualists. Like Bruno Latour, my late great former, uh, my late great friend who passed away in October, um, who basically says you can just keep opening up the past history of an object and you have to trace it through all the transformations it went through. Whereas I would say at a certain point, it no longer matters, the history, only certain aspects of the history of an object are retained. And you can even see this in the case of humans, right? A lot of things have happened to us over a lifetime, but only a few of them really left lasting traces. If I might be able to channel Graham Harmon every once in a while, uh, what would we call it, hermeneutics? Um, harmeneutics. Um, <laughs> I can imagine that the uh, notion of encrustation in Graham's work might be helpful in parse, parsing out some of these, you know, tensions, because I think that you know encrustation, as you understand them, could be highly contextual, but they're also very much not. Yes, that a, a, a thing has accidental qualities that mm -hmm. come from its history and mm -hmm. also from its context. But I was going to say something about your food question which is that I'm not sure Triple O should speak either for or against either of those because I get this with politics a lot. Like People will say, what is the politics of Triple O? Well, one of the things, if you notice important philosophers over history, they've, in modern period, they generally have both left-wing and right-wing admirers, like Hegel, like Heidegger, like not quite Marx yet, but I think eventually there might be some right-wing Marx fans. He sticks around as a classic. Uh, because I don't think there's a direct path from a theory of being to some specific political outcome. I think there's, I think a, a philosophy should provide new methods and tools for any of these fields to, to do things with, but it doesn't necessarily have to be aligned with one or the other. So um, if some of you know about Alain Badiou, the prominent current French philosopher. My biggest con it's a question now, how important is he in the history of philosophy? And my biggest concern about him is that he's a Maoist and all his admirers see, end up being radical Maoists. So it's like they're reading him for political contents, which is, it's a bad sign because what if the political content's gonna change every couple of centuries? There's gonna be different political options. Yeah. So what stops him from just becoming a propagandist for a 20th century political movement? I mean, Hobbes is a case in point because awesome. we, at this point we read Hobbes mostly <laughs> neutrally, especially mm -hmm. at the sort of undergraduate level or whatever, you know, right. uh, early philosophical education. And in that sense, you know, we've outgrown the, the polarity they're in. Um, any other questions? I believe Khan had a question, right? Oh, wonderful. You, you, oh. you, hand your, you put your hands up. <laughs> Well, I suppose the history might be able to be activated in different ways in the future, but if someone asks, I, I, if I say I'm coming to lecture at Woodbury University today and talk with Rawson, uh, 
someone asks me, what is Woodbury University? If I say it's made of stardust, that's accurate, but not, you know, especially germane to the way the question was pitched. Whereas what if, what if someone dug down to the 1945 layer of the soil on this campus and found traces of the Los Alamos atomic bomb test? So then the history becomes relevant again. You can find that, that it's still inscribed there somewhere. But consider this bottle, for example. I mean, it, it has an individual history, but it doesn't really matter, right? Any bottle of Arrowhead water is as good as any other bottle of Arrowhead water, barring unusual circumstances. And so that's the way I think the, the history becomes less relevant. And Michel Serre talks about, in that book of interviews he does with Bruno Latour, Bruno Latour asks, asks him a lot about his background, and he says at one point, your background becomes less and less important as you go on, right? Because you, you find yourself along whatever path at a certain point in your career, whereas when you're in your 20s, your educational background means everything. It, you know, it dictates what approach you take to things, but then by the time you're in your 50s, it's kind of faded a bit. You know, kind of, I think of, uh, um, Adrian Piper, the artist and philosopher, her definition of ideology is um, the set of false beliefs we harbor in protection of our comfort, right? And, and so the discomfort here is that we are shedding certain layers of our, of our um, normative um, setup, right? We, I mean, with triple O specifically. And so I feel uneasy and I very often want to, you know, throw this little book across the room, or just wrestle the person when I meet them um, finally, um, precisely because it feels like some of what we hold dear is being lost in the random, right? So um, I am sympathetic, um, but I also find it productive, of course, you know? I mean, think about, I've also asked myself, what is the opposite of ideology? Uh, it's creed, you know, a, a set of beliefs where they're not false and they're not protecting anybody's comfort, <laughs> right? <laughs> well, let's, let's take the example of Heidegger, uh, yeah. a very important philosopher, also a very controversial one because of his Nazi involvements. At one extreme, you'll find people who say, Heidegger's worthless, he's a Nazi. Uh -huh. uh, some even say taking him off of library shelves. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, the guy was a Nazi, and even before he was an official Nazi, he was obviously kind of a, a reactionary, um, Yet there are still things in Heidegger that don't really relate to that history in a relevant way. For example, Heidegger's famous tool analysis, which has meant a lot to me, <laughs> it's really a stretch to find any Nazism in that, right? The idea that when you're using a hammer, you forget about it and you only notice it when it goes wrong. Yeah. You really have to, to press things way too far to claim that there's some germinal Nazism hidden. I see people on Twitter have argued with me that there is, but I, how can you say that? That's like saying that you know, Heisenberg worked on Hitler's atomic bomb, so therefore we can't use the uncertainty yeah. principle. Well, of course you can use the uncertainty principle. You can decontextualize it a bit from its context in pre-Nazi yeah. and Nazi Germany. So that, this is the way in which I say that not everything in a history is necessarily, sorry, necessarily contained in the object. And I agree, this could be dangerous if someone says, hey, let's just use Mengele's medical data from Auschwitz, because mm -hmm. that, that's a little harder to detach yeah. from the fact that people were tortured in that camp and murdered. So, yeah, you've always got to be aware of a dark history that's hidden in certain objects. And we, yeah. ha we have this now with the Confederate flag and, mm. and things like mm -hmm. that. And I, I think there are certain contexts in which you have to look at the history. And the yeah. history disqualifies certain things. But that doesn't mean everything becomes indelibly contaminated if it ever touched something. There's, you know, going back a little bit uh, closer to aesthetics, uh, Jeanette Bicknell, one of um, a very good writer and philosopher that works um, in the field of aesthetics, wrote a paper bunch of years ago, probably 15 years ago, about the meaning of pop songs, which I tr treasure as a topic. And she says, we all demand of our Adele to really be heartbroken in her life so that the songs really resonate from the stage, right? And it's sort of like, oh, go get a divorce now because you owe it to us, right? And that's, that tension has a lot to do with the sense of comfort that we have with the historicity and the fidelity, right? Yeah. Um, of course, you know, we know that that is bound to be unsettled one way or another in Adele's case, because um, she ends up being happy, uh, much to our chagrin. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, any other questions? Uh, Sean, please. 
Yeah, I'm actually, when it comes to Pollock, I'm not a process per person. I'm a formalist when it comes to Pollock because, you know, Alf, um, I almost said Alfred Rosenberg, Harold Rosenberg, Alfred Rosenberg was the Nazi guy. Uh, uh, Harold Rosenberg called it action painting, right? He was trying to put forth the idea that it's really about the action. And the reason I think that's wrong is because if you see, I'll go to YouTube and find, uh, search for Jackson Pollock painting, and you're going to find a video of him splattering. But when you're watching that, you don't think, oh, this is the artwork itself. You think, oh, this is interesting. This is how Pollock did his paintings. Now, obviously, since Pollock, some artists have been process artists. I just don't think that's the right reading of him, and there's no reason that couldn't be a valid art genre. Um, so there are cases where the process can be embedded in the thing, but then there are cases where it doesn't matter at all. Like I mentioned this, probably no one really cares about the factory and how it made these bottles and filled them with water. You might, you might go on a tour of the factory, but most people just want a quick rehydration with this. I have no idea how my car was made that I use every day. I don't know that much about human anatomy, and here I am walking around in a human body, and I don't, I don't uh, physiology, I don't really understand how all this works. So um, when you design something, you're usually designing something for people who aren't uh, connoisseurs, right? You're designing the, for the end user who doesn't necessarily need or want to know about all the things that went into it. I mean, people who read my books, thank God there, there are some people willing to read my books, don't necessarily need to know all the annoyance and suffering that went into some of them, right? And how many hours I was sitting there, pausing on one sentence, not knowing what to say next. We don't need to know that. Um, so I think there are cases where process is a relevant part of the object and cases where it's not. I'll say, by the way, because I've been reading lots of Graham Harmon, believe it or not, in the last couple of weeks, um, and I, I could say about your work, and it's, you know, I, you, I called you a world builder, um, and I, I do believe you are one, but there's an accretionary model uh, to your process. And, and when I read stuff from 2013 and then 2020, there's, you know, continuities, there's sort of an iterative logic to it. And, and, but it is accretionary because it, it eventually amounts to something um, over time, you know, so let's call it processually, right? Um, now, in my case, it's funny because I see that kind of pa patterning in the rear view mirror. Mm -hmm. So I just read something I, I, I wrote, say, 10 years ago, and oh, I don't even, I didn't even realize how connected it is f to what I wrote two months ago, right? I mean, it's that kind of secret continuity almost, so to speak, right? And then, and then it does begin to amount to, I mean, in your case, you're basically, you back yourself into, into the legacy corner because you can't, um, undermine in any way what you've done so far. You know, it's monumental to a great degree and it's caught, you know, global, uh, the attention of a global audience. And so that's, I it's interesting, how, once you find yourself, you know, what kind of moves one makes. And then is it about moves or is it about uh, process? Yeah, there's always the danger of falling into imitating your past self. And mm -hmm. I know some critics have said that's what Picasso fell into after 1927. Yeah. He was painting Picasso shtick, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. He knew what his style was and was just became kind of lifeless for a while. Um, no, as I was telling you earlier, one of the reasons I write a lot is because I think best when I'm writing. Mm. And so if I were to go a whole year without writing a book, that would mean a year when I wasn't thinking very much, which mm -hmm. isn't going to happen, mm -hmm. right? So actually putting it on paper helps me arrange it. And you'll notice that like in early, early books, I was spending a lot of pages on Heidegger's tool analysis, but then the mm -hmm, part on mm -hmm. Heidegger's tool analysis gets shorter and shorter and shorter in each uh -huh, book, and yeah. now I don't even mention it. Mm -hmm. I talk more about Aristotle. So sometimes it just takes a while to work through an insight and feel like you've exhausted mm -hmm. it. If I might celebrate our questioner, um, Sean Joyner is someone who writes compulsively and gets better and better at it, ah. and has confessed to me, I mean, we've had many conversations about this, has confessed that, you know, it's a way to, to actually uh, articulate your thinking to, to, to yourself and to you know, make headway. But also there's a great humility with, with him that um, I specifically respect. Uh, more questions, we have probably 10 minutes. Oh, Justin, yeah, great. Yeah, um, 
Yeah, my way of putting it would be that the, the forms are different in the case of the plans and the actual building. Um, you know, materialism is hot these days in a lot of fields, right? Everyone, new materialism and um, the reason I don't call myself a new materialist is that I don't believe in matter. Uh, matter, I think, is this fiction that was posited in history that just, I think it was really invented in order to explain the difference between a thought and the mind and the same thing in reality, right? That the difference between this perfect mathematical model of a dog in my head and then an actual dog is that that dog, real dog, is in hearing and matter. But no one really knows what matter is. Um, even things like protons and, and uh, neutrons have structure, right? And maybe even, we don't know about electrons, maybe they do too, but, but uh, I would say that there are different forms in those two cases. And so there's, there's always going to be an incommensurability between any, any uh, plan and any actualization of the plan. It's like, a tr it's like translating something from one language into another. There's going to be some recognizable similarities, but there's, it's going to be a different thing. Every one of my books turns out different from how I expect, for instance. And even on the level of, I, never have in, I usually don't have input on the cover design. And the cover design has a huge impact on how you feel about the book and how others feel about the book. Mm. And that's someone totally different uh, from me. And I, I've gotten into a habit of not wanting to have influence on it because I want, I want to co-create it with the design team at whatever mm. publisher. Mm. And I kind of just take whatever they give me and make the best of it. <laughs> Lego. <laughs> Wasn't it? Yeah. Um, Justin, the one thing I was going to say is um, Back in my early punk rock days, I got into a band called, it's not even a punk band, but it's really abrasive music. It's called Ein Sturzender Neubatten. And um, there are two, they had two albums that were called Strategies Against Architecture. And I was like, oh, damn, give me that kind of album. Um, and, you know, really destructive. It's interesting because it's a deconstructive sort of approach to music where you use machines and all kinds of architectural objects. I think the f their first album was actually... Um, uh, recorded with a ca 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 cassette tape recorder in the air ducts of the, st of the Berlin subway. So that's, that's the craziness that's going on, right? Very up my alley when I was young. Um, and I'd imagine that, uh, that that membrane that you are looking at is a little bit more porous than, than not, right? Between art writ large and then architecture even when you get down to process. You could imagine, I mean, what does it mean to set up a studio in the air ducts? That's an architectural project al already. It's, it's, it's a matter of planning. It's, you know, I mean, of course it's vagrancy, but of a very, very creative and very intentional sort, right? At that point, you're a bit of an architect. Um, I think we have uh, time one for more? at least one more question. One more? Yeah, let's go for one more. Any questions from the audience? Go for it, yeah. I'll just say, I mean, I'll say, simply say that um, if it weren't for beauty, a lot of us wouldn't be here, as in surviving and thriving. Um, and so at, at some point, you know, a formalist interest or a formalist bent might be built into the experience of uh, creating beauty or, or, or um, seeking it. Um, now, does this have to uh, happen at the exclusion of other concerns? The answer is no. I guess there is a, enough of ambiguity once we start talking about um, formalism already, right? Um, but I, I did, it did resonate with me when, because uh, uh, I've written about, you know, the difference between high and low mm -hmm. culture, and it resonated what you said, that we have less and less high, uh, high culture, right? I mean, of course, it's disposable on certain terms, right? And it's also preposterous on certain terms. But it's also nourishing on other terms. And so I, I would say that formalism has that kind of, you know, double bind that, um, we have to be more aware of when we speak about formalism generally in architecture, but you know, it also formalism writ, writ large. I think the best case you can make for at least a version of formalism is first of all that uh, 
works are able to travel across time and space more than a contextualist approach would suggest. So you, you can produce Shakespeare plays in Indonesia in 2023 and it will be a meaningful theatrical experience to these people, I think. You, so that's one strike against the idea of reading him just as an expression of the social energies of the Elizabethan era, which no one reads him for that, right? You're not reading Shakespeare for historical information about the Elizabethan era, usually you could, but that's not the main reason we read him. Um, also, I think if you jump to contextualism too quickly, to the idea that everything affects everything else, what you lose is the fact that some things affect other things more than others do. So um, the scariest but most interesting lecture I ever saw in my life was in 2009 by the late James Lovelock, the Gaia theorist warner, warning us about possible death of the earth because of climate change. And usually when people think of climate change, they're thinking of holism, absolutely everything you do affects everything but that's not what he said. He said there are three things that endanger us. It was just three, it was a limited number. It was the death of algae in the oceans, the death of the rainforests, and the melting of the permafrost in Canada and Siberia. Those are the three factors that we have to worry about. So it's not that every little thing you do affects everything else. It's just that these three things are the factors. And so I'd rather have a situation where people focus on um, trying to figure out what the key environmental influences on a thing were and how they're retained or not retained in the final product than just saying, everything affects everything else, and then pulling out their favorite political hobby horse so that everything is explained as the result of capital or everything is explained as the result of, of religion or whatever, whatever your favorite anti-formal principle is. Uh, another great anti-formalist, of course, is Freud. Um, you know, the psychoanalytic readings of anything finds a psychoanalytic meaning underneath any art production to the point where he makes that great case that Oedipus Rex doesn't fascinate people for the reasons Aristotle said. It's not the discovery and the reversal that's in tragedy. It's this specific psychoanalytic fact of the Oedipus complex. And I don't know if that's true in that case, but he, I, I think he deserves to be on the list of the great anti-formalist critics in a way along with Aristotle because of what Aristotle said about how the emotion of the spectator is the key to tragedy, mm -hmm. not just the story. Yeah. So that, those would be my cases for formalism. The, the case against formalism, though, is the usual case is that it's elitist, right? It's mm -hmm. upper class white men playing games with analyzing the number of stanzas. And okay, there's, there's some of that too, but we can get rid of the class snobbery without getting rid of the quality snobbery, can't we? Um, and this is why I do like high culture in some ways. Mm -hmm. We have high culture in sports, right? We pick the best athletes and get, reward them and let them perform mm -hmm. for the best teams. Why are we not supposed to have this for architecture or philosophy? Mm -hmm. Yes, we can, we can argue about what's the highest quality stuff. There's always gonna be arguments about that, but mm -hmm. you, you need people performing at an elite level in any fields in order for the, the field to progress, I would say. Well, talk about uh, high culture. Graham Harmon, everybody. No. <laughs> thank you. Thank you all, thank you, thank you everybody that helped organize this. Um, uh, feel free to stay around for another five minutes and just snatch us into a corner and ask us a burning question or something. Um, we're not going to encroach on your time any further. Oh, um, this was lovely. Um, I hope that everyone, I think you and I will agree that this song is about you. Oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs>